I'm going to be sending out a link to you guys to our YouTube channel. Uh, we will be uploading the classes that we do this on there. So if you miss a class, you can always go back and watch it. Or something, if you miss something, if I move too fast, or you get a call, or any of that stuff, you can go back and watch the recording. Um, Jonathan's from the first night is going to be up as well, but it may this one may get loaded first just because I don't have Jonathan's lecture from the first night. As soon as he gets it to me or gets it uploaded on his own, then we'll get that in there. So we're going to go over chapters two and three tonight. Um, basically, it's just, like I said, it's basic Fire Academy stuff, but for some of it, it's been a while. So don't be upset or don't be, don't let it sound like I'm trying to say that you should know this or if you, if there's something you forgot, something you don't remember, or you just didn't grab it when you were in the Academy, that's okay. All right. So that's why we're covering this is to make sure that this is fresh in everybody's mind. We'll skip the knowledge objectives. I'm not going to read those off to y'all. All right, so it's vital for you as a fire inspector to know the varieties or the kinds of building construction and the type of materials that are used to construct a building. Um, you know, we always hear like steel doesn't burn. Well, no, it doesn't. However, fire will still affect it, right? Or the contents in the room may burn, that kind of thing. So. We have to keep this in mind when we're looking at plans, when we're doing a walkthrough, um, what exactly are we looking at? So like I said, this is going to be stuff that you learned in the academy or you, you may have learned it in training at the, at the fire department, but I want you to think of this from an inspector's point of view. Based on how a building is constructed, this will affect how fire grows and spreads. Uh, special safety features required to control the fire growth and protect lives and then applicable codes are going to change based on what kind of construction we're talking about. Type 1 and Type 5 are very drastically different, so they're going to have different codes. So as an inspector, you're going to evaluate construction methods and materials differently than architects and builders. Those guys typically build a building with cost in mind or ease of use and, uh, you know, this is fancy and it's going to draw people in and this is aesthetically pleasing and everything. And they don't ever give any thought to whether, you know, what's going to happen if this place catches on fire. That's just not in their, that's not their concern. A lot of them don't have any clue anyway, because that's not what they were trained and taught to do. So this is where we come in. So our chief concerns on our end are going to be fire prevention and building behavior under fire conditions. So our goal, first of all, is to make sure that we wanna to try to prevent the fire first, right? This is the proactive side of the fire service. But if it catches on fire, and in some places it will, I mean, sometimes it's inevitable. Um, building behavior under fire conditions, we wanna know if this building we're walking through were to catch on fire, what's the likelihood that people will get out? What are some barriers to those people getting out? Um, and we'll talk about a couple of different fires that have happened around the country, like the Station Nightclub. Uh, we'll talk about the high rise fire in Philadelphia because these are the kind of things that we really don't want to see happen again. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons from them, and that's what has shaped a lot of these courses. The most common types of materials you're going to see in building construction wood, especially you guys that have a lot of. Uh, like, you know, residential areas in your in your districts, most everything is going to be built out of wood. Masonry, concrete, steel, aluminum, uh, which has gotten, I saw that's been getting more common lately. Glass, gypsum board, and plastics. Factors that affect behavior of materials in a fire. Uh, combustibility, this is whether or not a material is going to burn. Almost everything we build can burn. The question is, Is will anything that's on fire near it get hot enough to make it burn? Uh, thermal conductivity, how readily a material will conduct heat. Decreased strength at elevated temperatures, which we'll talk about in a little while, and thermal expansion when heated, which we're going to really start talking about when we talk about steel. Masonry is kind of a blanket term. Now, this includes stone, concrete blocks, and brick. A lot of people, myself included, you know, the first thing that comes to mind with masonry is just brick, but there's a lot more to it than that. This is generally bonded together with mortar. This inherently fire resistant as long as it stays together. Um, poor conductor of heat, limiting passage of heat from one side to the other. 
often used to construct firewalls, which we'll talk about what those are in the next chapter, or at least later on in this one, which will help prevent the spread of fire from one side of a wall to the other side. All masonry walls are not necessarily firewalls, uh, however, and may be used for only for appearance. And there's a way to tell. We'll, we'll talk about that. I'm pretty sure there's going to be some pictures in the slides that will show that as well. Fire can spread through unprotected openings in the masonry wall. And depending on how old the building is and how many times it's been renovated, um, your firewall may look, or your masonry wall may look like a piece of Swiss cheese. It just depends. I know every time that we've added on buildings on some of the bases that I've worked at, when IT goes in there and they're about as far from firefighting as it gets, um, you know, they'll, they have no qualms about drilling holes in a wall to run wires through it. They don't realize what they're doing is drilling through a firewall and then, now you've got um, kinks in your armor. These can collapse after a prolonged exposure to fire if the, mo if the mortar is deteriorated. And this is a major, major hazard to us as firefighters, because if you think about it, you know, we want to get there, get close enough to the building that we have enough hose to run around inside and do what we need to do. But if, we're get, if we get too close and the wall collapses, um, that could obviously destroy a truck, but it could also kill or maim any firefighters that are in in that vicinity. So uh, we got at least seven people in the class tonight. Somebody tell me what the rule of thumb is. How close, what's the collapse zone of a building that we need to worry about? One and a half times. One and a half times. All right. Concrete, this is also naturally fire resistive. Uh, this doesn't burn or conduct heat very well. It's often used to insulate other building materials. So when we talk about type one and type two construction, Type one being protected steel that's usually protected with concrete. Does not have a high degree of thermal expansion. It does not lose strength when exposed to high temperatures. Often used for foundations, especially out there where a lot of you guys are, you know, concrete slabs, columns, floors, walls, roofs, and pavement. This is strong under compression, but weak under tension. So it doesn't really withstand if something's pushing on it. But you can compress down on it all day long and it's going to hold up pretty well. Uh, steel reinforcing rods are often embedded in concrete to strengthen it under tension. That is what type one construction is. Just remember, because they don't stand up to being pushed very well, if the steel starts to um, heat up and expand, it's going to knock that concrete down. And suddenly your type one construction is no longer type one and you've got much bigger issues. Uh, what's it called? when concrete starts to blast out let's say you've got a fire that's close to a set of concrete and it starts to chunk away spalding spalding good yep so anybody know what that is and we want to take a stab at why that's happening uh i assume concrete gets really hot when you cool it down with cold water uh you know <laughs> yeah, you're on the right track so even if you don't put water on it the reason the concrete will spall is because there's air gaps in it, right? I mean, this is basically just sand and some other stuff mixed together. So when it heats up, any moisture that's inside of the wall is going to expand when it turns into steam and it's going to start blowing out chunks of the concrete. But it can happen as well when you put water in it for the same reason. Or if you're, you're fighting uh, room and contents fire and the steam you create can do it. All right, moving on to steel. Steel is the strongest building material in common use. It's just really expensive. It makes no sense to build a residential home out of steel. Uh, this can be produced in many shapes and sizes from heavy beams to thin sheets, often used in structural framework of a building. Resistant to aging and it does not rot, which is nice. So unlike wood, uh, which will rot after a while. This can rust though, especially if you leave it open to air and moisture. Uh, steel itself is an alloy of iron and carbon. Well, you, know, you don't really need to know that, but it's just gee whiz stuff. With other materials added in to produce special steels by by itself, steel is not fire resistive. Um, hence the reason for type one where we protect it with concrete. Other materials are often used to protect steel from heat and fire. We just talked about that. Steel expands and will lose its strength as it is heated. When you start to heat up steel, and you can kind of see it in this picture here, steel doesn't necessarily burn. But what it does do is it expands. It loses its structural integrity. It'll start to push. Um, a truss like that that you see 
would be pushing laterally on a building. It can push a load bearing wall out and then you have the collapse. So for other metals, you may see um, aluminum. Like I said, I've a couple of years back, I started seeing a lot more aluminum being used on commercial buildings and even some residential. It, it holds up better than wood, um, but it's still a lot cheaper than, say, trying to build steel frame. So I've been seeing, you know, two by four size, basically, aluminum homes and, and some residential or I'm sorry, some commercial areas. But you'll also see it in siding, window frames, door frames, roof panels, um, different acriments that are going to be on homes. There's copper. We see copper a lot in the lines. Uh, a couple years back, that was really expensive. It was really like a high value. So people were going in and gutting homes out, gutting out construction areas and stealing the copper to sell it. Zinc is a coating to protect other metals from rust and corrosion. All right. Aluminum is occasionally used as a structural material in buildings. It's not as strong as steel, like I was saying. In fire, though, um, here's where the problem is. It will expand more than steel, and it'll lose its strength really quickly. So that's why it's not as good. For glass, glass is included in almost all buildings, with minimum just being your windows. So windows, doors, skylights, and some walls can be made out of glass. They're non-combustible, but they're not fire resistant. Um, heat and flame can get through them. Ordinary glass usually breaks in a fire, but especially formulated glass is sometimes used as a fire barrier. There's a couple different types. You have ordinary window glass. This is self-explanatory. It's exactly what it is, just basic glass. Um, if there's a fire inside, a lot of times it'll break the glass. And then you have sharps and jagged edges that are going to be a safety concern in these cases. Tempered glass is much stronger than ordinary glass. It's also a lot heavier. Anybody's got like a tempered glass table um, and ever tried to pick it up, you know, you know. Laminated glass, this is a thin sheet of plastic between two sheets of glass. Where do we normally see that as firefighters? Where do we like laminated glass all the time? Vehicles, cars. Yeah, so the, the front windshields, right? This is much stronger than ordinary glass. In a fire, laminated glass will tend to crack. Um, it could, it could spider web or however, um, but it'll remain in place because that film is going to hold it. You have glass blocks, which the only place I've ever seen those are in commercial buildings that are trying to have like some kind of aesthetic appeal. I've seen them in doctors' offices, things like that. These are thick pieces of glass, similar to bricks or tiles. They're limited in strength, but they usually do a good job of withstanding a fire. And then we have wired glass. Uh, you see this, like schools will use this. This is tempered glass molded with a reinforcing wire mesh. The wire holds the glass together when subjected to heat. And this is often used in fire doors, windows. I mean, my principal's office had it. That's, that's where I, that's always what comes to mind to me because I'm always looking through it. Um, anyway, gypsum. So gypsum board, you guys probably know exactly what this is. And if not by name, then when you start to see what it's called in other or what else is called, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. So gypsum is a naturally occurring minimal mineral made of calcium, sulfate, and water. It's a good insulator. It's non-combustible. And gypsum board is often used to cover interior walls and ceilings. It's also called drywall, sheetrock, pl plasterboard, that kind of stuff. So we're all familiar with it. Um, it's not just, you know, makes the room look nice it also actually helps resist a lot of fire we'll talk about that when we um before the end of the night if i've got time i'll talk about the station nightclub fire that happened up in rhode, At rhode island and how if all they had done was put sheetrock in the building it wouldn't have burned like it did the paper covering over a gypsum board will burn slowly when exposed to fire uh, this does not conduct or release much heat it's actually a very good insulator it's often used for a fire stop or to protect building components from fire. This does deteriorate and fail when it heats up, but it takes a bit. It's not a strong structural material. You're really not going to have a lot of weight applied to this. I mean, if you think about it, you can walk up to it and, and break it with your hand. It's easy, to, it's easy to get through. And then wood. This is what most of our stuff is built with, especially you guys out there with residential areas. Wood's the most common used building material. It's cheap. It's easy to use. It can be shaped into many forms. 
Uh, there's a couple different types. We have solid lumber, which is squared and cut into uniform lengths, laminated wood, which is individual pieces of wood glued together. Uh, these are actually pretty nice because they can run longer and still be stronger than solid lumber. It's not to be confused with like particle board. Wood panels, thin sheets of wood glued together. Uh, plywood is the most common example. You have wood trusses, assemblies of pieces of wood or combinations of wood and metal that work really well as long as they're not really messed with. Um, those those gusset plates, which we'll talk about later on, they're all they are like you know little tacks on a piece of metal that you would think that this thing would fall apart, but as long as it holds its structural integrity, it's great. It's when you start to set fire to it or you put a load that pushes laterally on it, those kind of things will make them fall apart. And when one fails or one spot fails, usually the whole truss falls apart. But you normally see those in floors and roofs. Uh, floors in some office buildings that may have, say like, you know, IT cables running under the floor. Um, and then also multi-story buildings, you're gonna see it. And then wooden beams. Wooden beams are assembled from individual wood components and they're efficient load bearing members. All right, continuing on. Uh, wood is fire's favorite fuel, basically. It's high combustibility, acts as a fuel in fire, it ignites at fairly low temperatures. It's consumed by fire, weakens and leads to collapse of structure. Fire behavior on this depends on ignition. Um, you know, you have to have an ignition source moisture so if the wood is wet it takes longer to fire to burn that's more like common sense i mean it's not going to stop it eventually the heat source is going to is going to vaporize the moisture and then your wood's going to burn new lumber generally contains more moisture than lumber in a building for many years so the older the building is the faster it's going to go up um our in my hometown of poplarville we had a uh, structure fire that took up an entire city block the building was over 100 years old and it went up like a box of matches. Um, by the time we got there, it was already almost too bad to get into. And it was, we were right down the street. So the density plays a part. Heavy, dense wood is harder to ignite than lighter, less dense wood because it disperses that heat more. So when we start talking about um, the classification, like, you know, type one construction or whatever, when we get to heavy timber, you would think that because it's made out of wood, that it'll go up quick. But because heavy timber has certain, um, Standards on what's considered heavy timber, the, the the lumber has to be a certain size. You could actually put direct flame on it and it'll withstand for a long time because it just disperses through the wood. It, it's not two by fours. Preheating, uh, the more wood is preheated, the faster it ignites. And then size and form, a large solid beam is more difficult to ignite and burns more slowly than a lightweight truss. Pyrolysis, you'll probably see this word on a test, just, you know, as a gee whiz, know this definition. Pyrolysis is a chemical change that occurs when wood is heated to a temperature high enough to release volatile compounds. So basically, this is right at your flash point. It's where you start to have that chemical change that we talk about when we're teaching teaching people about the fire tetrahedron. All right. Um, this is not at the flash point, though. This is just right before it. So you're going to have that decomposition, but there's not going to be combustion. Um, if you raise the temperature a little bit more, though, you're going to wind up with it. Fire retardant treated wood, by its definition, is going to be more difficult to ignite. But the problem with this is the treatment, the, pro the process of treating the wood reduces the strength. So if it's a load bearing, if, you, if you've got a lot of load on it, it may not burn as fast, but it could collapse. Plastics are often combined with other materials to produce building products, and we usually see this as more of a design feature than we do a, a, than a structural feature. So we see this in vinyl siding, window frames, skylights, exterior and interior installation, um, pipes and fittings, some tub and shower enclosures, lighting fixtures, carpet and flooring coverings. It's pretty much everywhere. We cover our house in it. We fill our house with it. And this is the stuff that is bad juju when it burns, right? So you're going to get that black, thick, boiling, violent smoke. Uh, it burns a lot hotter, burns a lot faster. And it's just, it's not like structure, or, I'm sorry, it's not like, you know, the bonfire in the backyard where you're standing around, you get smoke in your face. It's just a, 
an annoyance. If you breathe this smoke in, you're breathing in higher hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, all kinds of stuff that'll kill you long before the flames ever get to you. Um, and then, and that's important as you'll find out as we go further into this course. Uh, plastics often produce a heavy, dense black smoke. We already talked about that. Thermoplastic materials. These melt and drip when exposed to high temperatures. Uh, so they're solid normally, but they'll they'll melt. They can spread a fire. And then thermoset materials, these are fused by heat and will not melt as the plastic burns. They're already basically forged, so they're they're good. All right, types of construction. Um, anybody able to rattle these off? Just off the top of your head, anybody remember them that well? What you want to know about them? Just what they are. Like type type one is protected steel, type two is unprotected steel, and then so on and so on. Type type one is is uh, uh, non combustible. Type two is limited combustible. Three is ordinary. Four heavy timber. Five wood frame. Nice. All right. Yep. So we're going to go a little bit further into it. You're absolutely right. We're just going to kind of touch on some more details about it and some things, like I said, that we'll want to have in our mind as we're thinking of this from an inspector standpoint, and not a not a firefighter standpoint. So types one and two are assembled with primarily non-combustible materials and limited amounts of materials that will burn. So we're talking about your parking garages, um, military bases that have command centers in them are going to be built out of this. Let's see what else. Um, Type two is considered big box. So if you think of your Walmart, your Best Buy, those kind of things, those are going to be your type two buildings. Um, and the difference being one is protected steel. It has concrete around it. The other one is not. Uh, it's just just open steel. Which one were the Twin Towers up in uh, New York? want to say those were type two. They were type two by the time they fell. They were actually constructed as type one. Um, that's the thing that a lot, like a lot of the debates over how the towers fell and why they fell and stuff like that. Um, people recognize that they were type one. They're like, well, they shouldn't have burned, and 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 how did they collapse and everything? And we'll get into that. Um, I, I'm a big fan of case studies because we learn from our mistakes and we learn from like how things played out. Um, I'm not going to make you guys write reports, but I do like to talk about them. So type three, four, and five, these are the ones that are made out of combustible materials. Fire resistance, everything has a fire resistance to it. It can be a two plus hours, two hours, one hour, whatever. It's all rated. This is the length of time that a building or a building component can withstand a fire before igniting. Um, they're rated in hours, like I said, and the ratings are merely guidelines. So that's the Twin Towers I bring up because that's exactly the point. So they were built as type one. Um, they were supposed to withstand fire and collapse for a very long, like a very long amount of time. Uh, and they didn't. And that's why we, unfortunately, we had so many people in the buildings when they collapsed. Um, if we had known the extent of the damage to the concrete at the time, um, some decisions would have been made a little bit differently, possibly. But what happened when the planes hit the building, the towers were actually, if you think about it, if you've ever seen a schematic of how the towers were actually built, all of the weight bearing stuff was in the middle. So you had this, this core that had the stairwells, uh, the elevators, all that stuff was in the middle of the towers. And then each floor was like a, like a platter with a hole in it. It's like a donut that was stacked up. So all the weight was the exterior walls weren't necessarily the weight bearing walls. It was the middle core. And that was type one construction that when the planes hit it, they knocked all the concrete off. Um, and so now suddenly what was thought to be a type one building was a type two building. And then as we know, steel doesn't burn per se, but it does expand uh, and expands by the foot when it gets hot. So Steel expanded, collapsed the towers. That's why they fell straight down too, is because like I said, the load bearing portions of the buildings were actually in the middle. 
anyway, um, all that to say that the ratings are guidelines. So as a as a fire officer, which is a completely different tangent, but as a as a um, inspector as well, just know that just because it says on there that NIH has got this rated at two plus hours or whatever, there are some circumstances that could change that. Building codes specify the type of construction to be used. Um, so it's based on the height, area, occupancy classification, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, and the location of the building. Detailed requirements are given in NFPA 220, which is a standard on types of building construction. And so type one, we've already talked about, this is um, fire resistive construction, it's protected steel. This is the most fire resistive and they just kind of go downhill from there. We use this for buildings designed for large numbers of people, um, buildings with a high life safety hazard, tall buildings, large area buildings. Uh, like I said, my usual go-to is I'm thinking of parking garages. In the areas that we live in down here, usually that's what you're gonna see it in. Parking garages, um, some structures like bridges can be considered type one construction, even though we're not talking about inhabitable buildings. It's just protected steel. Type two construction is also referred to as non-combustible construction, but it's also, it's, it's not protected. So type two, think big box stores, um, Walmart, uh, some outdoor rodeo places are kind of considered the same thing, but your big box stores, some grocery stores, Walmart, Best Buy, those are your typical type two constructions. Steel is the most common uh, structural material for these. So again, they may not burn, right? The structure may not burn, but all the stuff that's inside of it will burn. Um, and then the building is at risk of collapse as that steel starts to expand. Did I go backwards? Hold on, I'm getting mixed up with the slides because it just jumped from type one to two and then back again. All right, here we go. So this is the type two slide. Um, this last comment down here kind of drives on what I was saying about the stuff inside of them will burn. What's inside determines the fire severity. So if you're using, you know, if you've got building supplies, if you're a type two building, but it's, it's like, um, I forget what the name of the place is in Poplarville, that that's all they sell is like chips and board and, and bricks and stuff like that out on uh, 26. That's really not that that's not that big of a deal, right? That stuff's not going to burn any better than the building does. But if you're a furniture store, then that's obviously a much higher fire severity, not because of the building, but because of what's inside of it. There we go. Type three construction is used in a wide variety of buildings. Uh, this is normally considered downtown building construction because everything's made out of brick. This is usually limited to buildings of four stories or fewer, sometimes found in buildings up to seven stories. Uh, actually, the, the City Hall in Buffalo, New York, it's it's huge, like the building in the picture. It's actually a lot bigger, though, and it's, it's type three up to a certain point. The upper half of the building is actually um, type five. It just looks, it's, you know, brick veneer on the outside to make it look like it's a brick all the way up. Masonry exterior walls actually are load-bearing walls. They support the floors and the roof structure. Wooden interior structural and non-structural members, so the inside will burn pretty easily. Gypsum board and plaster are usually used as an interior finish, which is good because that's where a lot of your interior fire resistance is going to come from. They do have limited fire resistance requirements, so key interior structure components may be required to have ratings of one or two hours. It's not that bad or there may be no requirements, it just depends. Some buildings use interior masonry walls to meet the requirements. Um, so they're gonna have real brick on the inside as much as the outside. That way the fire resistance goes up. There's two separate fuel loads here. You have the contents as well as the combustible building materials. There still could be some building material inside of these buildings that's you know, made out of wood, if they went in and updated the building to try to help support it, because over time, the weight of these buildings on these masonry walls are going to start to make the building, the walls bow out. So 
if it's a historical landmark or something of that sort where they want it to try to they want to try to keep it as original as possible but they want to make it short up and last longer sometimes they'll make it kind of a hybrid they'll go in and they'll put in some wood paneling or wood frames to help hold up the wall um there's a couple other things that if you see this you know it's a real type three and it's not just a type five with fake brick on the outside Newer buildings may succumb to fire much more quickly than the older buildings built from solid lumber. All right, type four construction. This is heavy timber. Um, I'm trying to think. Anybody in any anybody in this class have type four construction anywhere in their districts that I can think of? I can't I can't think of any, but I'm I don't know. It, this is heavy timber. Um, some barns use this. Uh, old aircraft hangers would use this. We have some in Abita, uh, some of the churches Saint. in downtown. Okay, so St. Jane, St. St. Jane Church is the main one. Okay, I didn't know that's all right. That's cool. Type four is kind of interesting to me um, because it's made out of wood, but it's almost as non-combustible as type three. I mean, it's because of the way that it's built. So this is heavy timber. Exterior walls may be masonry, but it's not, that's not the defining feature of the, um, of the structure. Wooden interior walls, columns, beams, floor assemblies and a roof structure could be, some of it could be two by four, but the actual structure itself is gonna be heavy timber. Wood is much heavier than in type three construction. This is difficult to ignite and it will stand fire longer, mainly because of how thick the wood is, how dense it is. Like I said, you could get a flame source and put direct flame impingement on these timbers and it will take a long time for them to burn because as fast as you're applying the heat, it's just dispersing through the wood. It's not going to it's not going to get the wood hot enough for a very long time to burn. Now, if the interior contents start to burn and it gets hot enough, then yes, eventually it will overtake the timber. It just depends on what's in it um how how does it burn how long is it burning before the fire department gets there this building construction a lot of times you're going to find that the interior contents are still more of a concern to you than the building itself the building itself is pretty resilient so when heavy timber is constructed to meet code it has no concealed spaces so there's no like drop ceilings or anything of that sort that will create hot pockets to hold uh, flame or, or hold extra heat. This helps reduce horizontal and vertical fire spread. Vertical elevators, stairs, machinery may provide a path for fire spread though. It just depends on how it's been built and how it's been updated because a lot of your heavy timber stuff is not new construction. Uh, a lot of these are old, renovated. Some things have been added in and they really didn't think about fire code when they were renovating it, that kind of stuff. The columns, support beams in the floor and roof assemblies roof assemblies will withstand fire much longer than the smaller wood members in ordinary construction, which we're going to talk about next. Once involved in a fire, these can burn for a long time. Oh God, if you if this actually catches on fire, it's going to be a long day for the fire department because as long as it takes to get the heat to that point, it'll take about that long to get the heat away from that point or to get the wood away from that. Because again, the, the density of the wood means that what you're doing to the outside of it is going to take forever to get to the core. All right, mill construction. This was common during the 1800s, especially in the Northeast. You really saw this mostly in factories and warehouses. Heat from a fire in one of these buildings could spread fire to nearby buildings. Um, without sprinklers, this is a major fire hazard. I think half of Chicago burned down because of this construction getting out, the fire getting out of control. Conversions into small shops, galleries, office buildings, and residential occupancies over time may introduce voids and flammable contents that weren't originally there when the building was built. So appropriate fire protection and life safety features must be built into the conversions, um, sprinkler systems, gypsum board, uh, maybe you know fire escapes firewalls any of those kind of things that you can put in there to prevent fires because you you no longer have a built to code type 4 construction at this point and then type 5 construction this is what some of you guys this may be all you have in your district this is what most everything is built of in type 5 construction all components are made of wood or other combustible materials 
The most common type of construction used today is type five. You use this for most of your residential homes. So one and two family dwellings, small commercial buildings, larger structures up to four stories high. It's often no fire resistant components. It will burn and it will burn very easy. Some codes require a one hour fire resistance rating for limited parts of the buildings. It just depends on what the building is used for, for those. Uh, remember, you know, the whole reason we have type five construction is because we try to save money. And at some point you start to give up safety for savings. There's always that balance that we try to strike. These can rapidly become totally involved in fire. Um, usually has voids and channels that allow fire spread. So attic spaces, crawl spaces, um, collapse is common because again, the minute you pop one gusset plate off of a truss, you're probably going to lose the truss. And then once that goes, the truss next to it is going to start to have a lateral pull. And then now that one's going to fail and it's going to keep on going. Smoke detectors are essential. Um, any of y'all give out smoke detectors? Uh, some, some departments get funding to actually provide smoke detectors to people. I don't know if, I know, I know some of y'all don't, but I don't know if anybody else in the class might or has looked into it. Louisiana State Fire Marshal's Office actually has a program that uh, funds us for smoke detectors for us to uh, install in homes in our fire districts. And it's done all the way across the state. That's good. All right, so Louisiana is a statewide thing. That's awesome. Hey, Rob, they do the same thing in Hancock County, bro. Okay, so all right. Uh, so not, not Mississippi State, but the county's got it? Yeah, the county does a 30 uh, EOC. It distributes smoke detectors to all the uh, fire departments. Nice. That's good. Uh, the volunteers in uh, Perver County do too. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I, you know, I, I hate to say change is slow in the fire service and fire prevention is, is in a lot of ways, it still looked at like, um, like your SCBA was back in the 90s, where it's like, you, you know, you're a wuss if that's what you're doing and people are concerned about their job security for some reason instead of saving lives but um i'm glad to see that a lot of prevention programs are, are getting bigger i mean the fires are still going to happen the rescues are still going to happen so why not cut down on the number and save on some of the lives or even just even if you're just looking at property value um it's a really good thing to have going newer construction is lighter weight saves a lot of money uh, but unfortunately, like I said, you know, the buildings can collapse early, suddenly and completely. There may not be anything left standing. Buildings may be covered with wood siding, vinyl siding, aluminum siding, brick, veneer, which looks real. But there's little little tells um, that let you know that it's fake or stucco. The covering does not reflect the type of construction. So just because it looks like brick on the outside doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be brick like type three. Um, most likely, if it's built in the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years now, it's probably going to be type five construction. So there's at some point the building is made out of two by fours. Uh, there's two systems that we use to assemble type five construction. Let's see, am I on the right? That's the right slide. Okay. Um, you have your balloon frame construction, which is not permitted by today's code. So you won't find any new buildings being built like this, but you may still find some in existence because if something super, if something predates a code, it just gets grandfathered in. Um, a new code doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to go back and fix what is now not allowed. It's just when you renovate it, um, especially if you renovate over a certain amount, then you have to bring the whole, whole building to code. But until then, it can stay what it is until you either do that or it burns down, one of the two. Um, but anyway, balloon frame construction, this is where wood studs on the exterior wall run from the basement to the roof. So if it's a three-story building and you get a fire in the basement, that fire will climb all the way up to the roof and there's nothing to stop it once it gets to the outside of the, of the structure. And then the other one is platform frame construction. Um, that is what you normally see now that's modern. The first floor is constructed as a platform. The first set of studs extends only to the underside of the second floor, and then you have a break. So there's a piece of wood. The um, the stud, the outside studs don't continue to the roof unless it's just a one floor building. But um, that way, if you have a fire on the first floor, it doesn't just automatically go all the way up past everything and then catch the, the building on fire from bottom to top. At each level, 
the floor platform blocks the path of any fire rising within the void spaces. Okay, yeah, we still got time before a break. All right, so now we're gonna talk about building components. This is where we start getting out of the, the recap of the academy and getting into some more inspector level stuff. The main purpose of a foundation is to transfer the weight of the building, which is considered the dead load, and the contents, which is the live load, to the ground. So a building has to, first of all, if you think about this from a construction standpoint, the building has to support itself before you put any furniture in it, any people. The building has to at least just have enough studs and enough um, structural integrity to maintain the weight of itself. Um, that is your dead load. That's the load that is there just by the building existing. And then your contents, which includes people, is your live load. Now, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here because I'm not sure. I didn't see it in the lesson plan later on, and I don't know if another chapter is going to hit on it. Live load kind of sucks when you're thinking about it from a uh, from a planning standpoint, right? If you just put living room furniture into a room, that's fine. It's, it's not going to weigh that much or whatever. But if you try to host a block party on the second floor of an apartment that's not meant to have people jumping around and, and moving and, and shifting weight like that, um, that's a hard thing to plan for. So when you get to Inspector 2 in a couple of weeks and you're looking at floor plan and stuff, um, that's where occupancy types kind of come into play. Uh, some things to consider when you're looking at how something is built is what's this building going to be used for? You know, it may be a residential building, an apartment building that's going to have an elderly couple in it just kind of trudging around. Or it could be an apartment building full of college kids that are spilling water on the floor and, and weakening the uh, the wood and then jumping up and down to whatever party music they're listening to. And suddenly they collapse to the floor below them. Um, just something to think about. But anyway. It is essential to the long-term stability of a building that you know the difference between the two and make sure that they can actually handle those loads. Modern foundations are usually made of concrete or masonry. Wood may be used in some areas, but it's not really common. Actually, I see more wood used in northern buildings because they have crawl spaces and basements under them. And, and then out, like, out in southwest Louisiana. Um, shallow or deep, depending on the building and the soil com composition. Problems are usually caused by improper construction, um, shifting soil or earthquakes. Uh, floods can do it down there where y'all are at. Most foundations remain intact even after a severe, a severe fire. So, you know, that relatively insulting term of being called a slab saver. That's why they, they say that, because you can, you can lose the entire house, but the slab will still be there. When inspecting a building, look for cracks that indicate movement of the foundation or areas that might compromise support. In multi-story buildings, floors and ceilings are often considered a combined structural system. They, they work together. All right, so we have fire-resistive floors. These are designed to prevent vertical spread of a fire and to prevent collapse when fire occurs in a space below the assembly. So if a fire is in the basement, these floors are designed to stop the fire from coming up to the first floor and beyond. Concrete floors are common. Self-supported or supported by steel beams or trusses, and often avoid space between the ceiling and the floor. If anybody has seen a building being constructed with multiple floors, they have, it's about like, um, you guys that actually work in construction will probably know exactly what the length is, but there's a flat truss that is made for each floor of a multi-story building. It's not pitched like a normal roof truss would be. I want to say it's like two feet. I could be off on that, but that's, it provides a void space between the ceiling of the first floor and the actual floor of the second floor, and then so on and so on on the way up. These areas sometimes can contain electrical or telephone wiring, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning ducts. Plumbing, uh, fire sprinkler pipes will run through here if this space is not subdivided by fire-resistant partitions or protected by automatic sprinklers, the fire can get through here really quickly. Uh, it's one of the biggest issues about it. And again, you know, usually when something is built, it's fine. It's built to code is when you start renovating and adding things in. That's when you start messing with the um, the building's design as far as fire prevention goes. Wood supported floors. These are common in non fire resistive construction. So your type five stuff is going to have this range from heavy timber to lightweight construction. Heavy timber can provide a huge fire load. 
It can also contain and withstand a fire for a considerable, considerable length of time. Conventional wood flooring is used uses solid lumber as beams, floor joists, decking, and finished flooring. Uh, when these burn, these burn pretty steady, and it takes about 20 minutes for them to burn through. So that's something that um, we consider when we're when we're when we're talking about fire officer level stuff as well. Is how long has this been burning? Um, so for, you know, we have an idea of how how much time do we have to put people inside this building to look for lives before we have to worry about con, um, collapse. You have the same thing from the inspector standpoint, but again, we're talking about um, planning rather than reactive approaches from a fire ground. Modern lightweight construction uses structural elements that are less substantial, which may not provide any resistance to a fire. Ceiling assemblies. Structurally, the ceiling is considered part of the floor assembly for the story above. We were talking about how those trusses work. That one piece, the bottom of it is the ceiling of the first floor. The top of it is the floor of the second floor. And then that repeats as you go up floors, depending how many you got. Um, the primary function is to hold light fixtures and diffuse light. Also conceal HVAC systems, wire and, and fire sprinkler systems so that they're not just hanging down below the ceiling in the rooms below them. This can be part of the fire resistive package, depending on how it's built and if they've put anything in there to do that. Sometimes fire rated as part of the floor assembly. Roofs protect the inside of the building from the weather. It's pretty common sense. After not uh, often not designed to be as strong as the floors, because especially when you're talking about um, residential buildings, you're not you really you're not going to be having that much stuff up there. You can get up there and walk on your roof, fine, but you're not going to have a whole bunch of people up there. Um, and if they are, they're usually spread out. So we don't build them to hold as much stuff as what say the living room would hold. There's three pri primary designs. We have a pitched roof, which is what you see in the picture. Uh, these are sloping or inclined surfaces. Variations include gable, hip, mansard, gambrel, and lean-to roofs, usually supported by rafters or trusses. Your rafters are solid wood joists mounted in an inclined position. No, we're not there yet. Sorry. Lightweight construction uses wood trusses for most pitched roofs, and these can fail after a brief exposure to heat and fire. The minute um, one of those pieces of wood starts to either burn through or something happens and the gusset plate gets popped off, the whole thing can collapse. Steel trusses are also used to support pitched roofs, which will last a little bit longer, which is great. Um, but with that comes more weight. And you also have the expansion problem of steel once it starts to heat up. These resist fire according to how well the steel is protected. Roof coverings include shingles, clay, and slate tiles and metal panels. So think about the difference between a um, a residential house and a commercial building, as far as a roof goes. Most of your residential homes have tiles on them, uh, shingles rather. And what is what are your roofs? What do you typically find on a roof of a commercial building? Air conditioning units. Yeah, I was about to say not just your construction being you know tar and stuff like that, but you have your HVAC systems up there. Um, you have a lot more weight put on that roof. So with that means um, much higher risk of collapse because as the reef, roof starts to as it starts to lose its integrity, the weight of whatever's up there is going to start to really push down on it. And you may have an earlier collapse than what you expected because the material may be rated for two hours, but that's just the material in the lab. That's not the material with an HVAC system sitting on it. You know, that, that speeds up the process. That's why those ratings about how long something is supposed to last are definitely guidelines. Curved roofs. They're used for buildings that require large open interiors. Um, so what comes to mind with these for me are the old, you know, have you ever seen like an old World War II era um, aircraft hangar? That's something that's got a curved roof. Decking ranges from solid wood boards or plywood to corrugated steel sheets. Roof coverings often consist of layers that include felt, mineral fibers, and asphalt. So if you've ever, like, if, you, if you're underneath them, um, it kind of looks like they're covered in some kind of dirt, but 
that's just that's there by design and then the top of it is covered as well flat roofs these are mostly for your commercial buildings most have a slight slope so that the water can drain off but it's almost in it's not noticeable to the naked eye it looks like it's just flat otherwise water may pool and cause the roof to collapse uh, support and supports are generally wood or steel these are the kind of roofs that you're going to find those hvac systems on lightweight construction supports are much less fire resistant than solid wood systems so most of these because they're made in um, they're made for commercial buildings a lot of times they're going to be made out of steel steel must be protected from excessive heat most are covered with multi-layer built up roofing systems and most contain highly combustible materials all right almost break time a truss is a structural component composed of smaller components in a triangular configuration or a system of triangles so basically this is like a house of cards um, all i'm going to say about trusses is basically they work great when they're put together properly and they're holding weight in the direction that they're meant to hold it but they can come down pretty easy um, like i said there's no most of your trusses aren't built with nails except in a couple of spots we use gusset plates to hold everything together and when those things come out it, it's usually the truss is going to fail and that whole section will fall and the trusses are built to take uh, weight in a top-down manner so if you have a line of trusses and one fails the one next to it is now supporting a piece of the roof that doesn't have that original trusses support anymore and it will start to pull and now that those trusses are going to start to pull they're going to fail and then now you got more roof pulling and so even more can fail it just it's a domino effect there's three common trusses parallel cord truss which is what you see at the top there that's usually going to be um, between floors like if you have a multi-story building that's also what you'll see and underneath the roof of a big box store for type 2 construction it's just made out of metal warehouses use that um, the reason it's called parallel cord is because the top and the bottom beam that runs horizontal those are the cords and they run parallel to each other you have your pitched cord truss you normally see that in roofs and then your bowstring truss it looks like a bow hence the name um, those are for your curved roofs walls shape the exterior and define the interior of the building so there's a construction of many kinds of materials and there's a couple different types we have load bearing walls these are the walls that actually support the weight of the structure usually it's your exterior walls but you know not always the case um, these transmit load down to the building's foundation and damaging or removing any of these can cause the building to collapse now you got to be careful when people go in and start trying to renovate something they don't know they start tearing down a wall if it winds up being a load bearing wall they've got bigger problems than what you know was wrong with their bathroom or whatever they were doing um, you have your non-bearing walls these are your interior walls they typically don't support any weight of the building so if you tear through them to try to make two rooms into one for example a lot of times you don't really have any problems with the structural integrity of the house because these walls are just there as dividers anyway they're not holding any weight they're less stable than load bearing walls just because they don't need when they were built they didn't need that stability built into them all right some other walls you have party walls um, these are the things that you're going to want to see and pay attention to as an inspector so when you're doing when we start talking about classifications like occupancy classifications um, some of these walls have a definitive purpose in how we classify buildings and how can you have one building with two different classifications so party walls share by they're shared by a building on each side of a property line think of a um a duplex for example where if you've ever looked at one from the street and you see this big brick wall running down the middle uh, that is essentially a party wall that divides the building into two different structures even though it's one solid structure um, you basically cut it in two so if that wasn't a, uh, not a duplex let's say it wasn't a residential you could technically have an assembly on one side and then and a residential on the other that's possible because the party wall is basically it's an interior wall in a sense that it runs through the middle of the building but it's built as a complete um break between the left half and the right half of the building so it allows you to do that um 
which is pretty cool when you're dealing with like downtown areas where the whole block might just be one big building. They do that so that you can use that one big building to do multiple things. You have firewalls. These are designed to limit fire spread from one side of the wall to the other. Um, they don't, they, they're usually interior only. You don't see them sticking out of the building like a party wall would. These might divide the building into sections or separate two attached buildings, um, but they don't necessarily do it to the point where you can make one, one classification and the other one a different one. These usually extend from the foundation to the roof. They're designed to stop the fire from spreading. If they only went halfway, then they wouldn't do anything. Constructed of fire resistant material and maybe fire rated. They're freestanding, non load bearing walls. So you can technically take these things down. The building is going to be fine. Fire petitions. These extend from a roof to the underside of the floor above and may enclose fire rated interior corridors or divide a floor into um, separate fire compartments. So if you're in a large building, um, let's say it's an old type three building that they converted into a, an office complex or whatever, you may see these kind of walls lining a escape route uh so like a hotel for example the 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 corridor the main hallway corridor may be lined with these kind of walls so that you're protected either on the inside or the outside depending on where the fire is at fire enclosures often called exit enclosures um, assemblies enclosing interior vertical openings these prevent fire and smoke from spreading from floor to floor, floor to floor, sorry. They usually run vertical, not horizontal. Curtain walls. These are non-load bearing exterior walls attached to the outside of a building. Partition walls. These are easily replaceable interior non-load bearing walls. So, you know, easy come, easy go. You can tear them down. You can fight through them. If you're, if you do have firefighters in the building, those walls can be punched through easy. They don't have to worry about any kind of structural damage coming down on your firefighter. Or um, if you're dealing with people that are renovating, you walk in and you look at it and you see that it's that kind of a wall. You can be like, yeah, whatever, do whatever you want. It's not gonna, it's not gonna matter. And then we have parapet walls. That's what you see on this picture. A lot of your um, commercial buildings these days use parapet walls because they're using them to hide the HVAC unit or um, all the different vents that that go to the roof, uh, especially for like restaurants. These are these are tricky, especially if you're on the bottom, if you're on the ground looking up at them. These extend above the roof line. They almost look like, they almost just look like part of the top floor. Like you would think that the roof is gonna be right there at the top of them and that's where it gets dangerous. Um, they're exposed on three sides. They're freestanding. The floor might be like you can see on this picture. Um, the roof actually is a good two to three feet below the top of the parapet. Um, those things are extremely prone to collapse. That's one of the biggest issues. Um, they can rest on a load bearing wall or a non load bearing wall, but they themselves are not load bearing. They're usually there for looks only. Masonry walls, if they're well constructed, can withstand vigorous assaults by fire. An outer layer of brick or stone does not necessarily mean walls or masonry. So they can be fake. It can be. Um, veneer uh even if it's not veneer let's say it is real brick if it's not if that's not the primary support structure of the wall then it is still just for looks only wood framing is used to construct the walls in many small commercial buildings and this can be covered with a variety of materials so insulation is usually first applied and then the space between the two walls often provides a pathway for fire the cool thing is some a lot of insulation these days is actually fire retardant um old old buildings like my um my great aunt's house her insulation was actually just newspaper so you know not fire retardant at all i had newspaper in the floor did you in, be <laughs> in between oh. four layers when i ripped it up yeah you talking about the house your house out in pearl river yeah, and that was dated back to 1940-something when they did it. Yeah, I was about to say, I, I've seen your house. It's nice, but it's it's old construction, so I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> um, all right, we're about to take a break. Let me get through these couple of slides here. So columns are load-bearing structural members. These perform the same function as a load-bearing wall, but if you have, say, like a really wide open room, you'll find columns in there. A lot of your commercial buildings have that. 
Um, they support internal walls and elements, but they do it in a way that allows you to use a lot of the floor space without sectioning off the rooms. The improper replacement of a load-bearing masonry wall, uh, sorry, masonry walls with a column and I-beam configuration can result in the collapse of a structure, especially when you start putting blame on it. All right, and we're going to take a break here. Uh, take 10 minutes. Be back at 7.10. We'll continue on.
All right, let's finish up the chapter. We actually don't have that much more to go for this one. So beams, girders, joists, and rafters sit on walls or columns and provide support for other loads within the structure. Um, these sometimes get in the way of things, and so people will find ways to um, kind of not really renovate a room, but they'll 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 find ways to like fill the gaps or whatever so that they could put their furniture more flushly up against a wall. In fact, we were moving some furniture around at the base uh, the other day, and one of my coworkers who who knows better was trying to come up with some ways that could that he could do that to make the room more um I don't know what the word what I'm looking for more um open to different different ways of arranging things because he's trying to make himself look good to his boss which I, I mean I get that but um you don't want to do things to tear up the cuz he wasn't looking at adding something into the space he wanted to find a way to like tear the <laughs> tear those corners down I was like yeah I wouldn't do that um Anyway, so there's a couple differences between these because I digress and I'll do that a lot. A beam is supported at both ends, a simple beam, or at more than two points, which is a continuous beam. Um, if it's going a, a long way, they'll have to be more than one, more than just the ends being supported. These are relatively large, and you typically only see these in things such as, you know, going back to aircraft hangars or something big like a gym is not big enough. You usually won't see it at a gym. Um, so think bigger than that. A girder is a beam that supports other beams, and then a joist is a wood beam, usually recognized as part of the roof or a floor assembly. And you have your rafter. Um, a rafter is yeah, I'm on the same side. Is a beam used to support roof systems? The strength of a beam decreases as its length increases. Um, just the further it goes, gravity starts to pull down on it in the middle, and that's where you get those. Sometimes you'll have columns placed, like we were talking about earlier, to help support that. The dimensions must increase as the length increases. So if you're not going to support it, you need to go from maybe a two by two to a four by four or even bigger, the further the distance. That way it can withstand that lateral pull of gravity on it over time. The practical limit is approximately 24 feet. Um, the trusses are used to span distances longer than that. For doors and windows, doors, we are very good at getting through them when we need to. Uh, door is the entryway itself. The jam is the frame that the door sits in. Your hardware is your handles, hinges, locks. And that's important because we're going to start talking about fire escapes and like what's what's acceptable for a, um, you know, like a, a door that is meant to be a means of egress from, a, from an emergency. So like what you see in the picture, if that were a... Um, if that were a commercial building that was going to allow more than a certain amount of people inside of it, that door would absolutely not work for a means of egress, not just because of the size, but also the handle, the locking mechanism, um, all that stuff is going to play a part in it. And then you have your actual locking device, which is in the handle or encased in the door itself. Types of wood swinging doors. We have solid core and hollow core. Usually when you're dealing with interior doors, you're talking about hollow core. The doors don't have anything in them. They're, they're like that picture on the right. Um, they're lightweight, which is great, but they really don't offer you any protection. They don't offer you any protection from an assailant. They don't offer you any protection from a fire, none of that. And you have your solid core doors, like you see on the left side of that picture. Um, they are the same size on the outside, but they're solid. They have more weight to them. They're going to withstand things better. Uh, they just cost more money. That's really, really the big difference between the two. The hollow core will burn through very quickly. The solid core will hold up a little bit better. Uh, there's also ledge doors, which isn't in the slide. These are wood doors with a horizontal bracing, so they usually will slide. You can think of them like either sliding glass doors or um, some wooden doors like barn doors would be like this. And then we have panel doors, which are solid wood doors, and these can be either exterior or interior. Your doors may also be made of metal or glass. Um, that one looks like a metal door, for example. So we have types of doors, inward swinging, exterior frame with a stop and rabbit that keeps the door from opening past the latch. 
So if it's going to swing inside, like that door right there, would that be acceptable on a, um, I know we haven't gotten to it yet, but just some of you probably already know it. Would that be acceptable on a residential house? If the front door swung inward? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, most of them are, right? Your, your front door swings in. Um, what about a commercial building? No, it wouldn't be allowed. No, exactly. And the reason being is because we're, we build, we build commercial structures with the idea that we want people to be able to get out. Um, that's anybody heard of the station nightclub fire other than my, my passing mention of it earlier. Yes, I actually, I did a case study on it once. Okay, so in regards to the door, then, because you you probably are as well versed on this as I am, the station nightclub, the main doors to go into the building itself were double doors like any other commercial building. Fantastic, right? But the problem was when you opened up, um, when you got into that first area, they had like a little little foyer. Um, atrium or whatever you want to call it where you had your 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 not really your bouncer but somebody there to check to make sure you know get the cover charge and everything and then you went through a door like what's in that picture to get to the rest of the club and it opened in that was not part of the original building that was added on it was one of the many things wrong with that place um and that wound up being the problem because when the fire started and people started trying to get out first of all they were all pigeonholed through that little bitty door um and secondly the door opened in so you know when people start pressing on it obviously the door is not designed to go outward and that was one of the main problems some other doors we have we have outward opening doors They're basically the same as that one it's just the other direction uh these are used in commercial occupancies for most exits and the hinges are often sealed so there you go and then you have the emergency, the basically the oh shit bar, which is how you open that door. Um, you just press on it and it opens. You don't have to turn a knob. You don't have to do anything. So you could literally fall into that door and it will open. Sliding doors, often constructed of tempered glass. Um, these are found in rooms that open onto balconies or patios. There's a weak latch in the frame secured that secures the movable side. But what's something that people do? with these that will it renders that that whole locking mechanism doesn't even matter you're still not going to get the door to slide open they do it for mostly anti-theft reasons can y'all think of anything they shove a broomstick in them to keep you from opening them. <laughs> yeah because that makes that makes great sense if you're worried about getting um you know somebody breaking into your house but as far as us as being firefighters wanting to go through there, it's never as easy as just sliding that door open because that stick is down there a lot of times. Um, revolving doors. Well, there's your sliding glass. Revolving doors. I don't ever see these in the South. I can't think of anywhere that's got one down South. You really see them in like Chicago, um, New York City, stuff like that. These are commonly found in upscale or large city buildings. Usually made of four glass. I take that back. You said you said that was a revolving door. Yes. Oh, that's what my ex-wife has. <laughs> We're being recorded, sir. <laughs> Give me a minute. All right, moving moving on. Um, there's a one of the. I think it's the West End in new orleans has a has a revolving door um these our opening doors are often found next to revolving doors just in case for safety so you like in the picture you've got one on each side but the cool thing about these revolving doors is at no point do you ever have a real opening to get into the building so they're fantastic for cold weather um as the door rotates you know it's always closed basically the door that that whole entrance is closed and then we have overhead doors like you see in garages and um <laughs> garages and warehouses that kind of thing these are different designs different sizes um they may roll up they may just bend and get held 
suspended above, who knows, different materials. Um, these can be just plastic, like what you see on this um, bottom picture. They may actually sometimes be high security, can't get through them. You need the K-12 to get through it kind of thing, too. It just depends on what you're dealing with. An inspector needs to be familiar with specific types of windows as well, found in local occupancies, so glass construction. The glazed or the transparent part of the window is usually made out of glass. Sometimes you'll see it made out of plastic or um, some kind of, I'm not gonna say vinyl, but like a, a weird plasticky um, material, it just depends. There are several configurations. We have regular glass, which is a single pane glass. A lot of your, a lot of your homes are getting rid of those because they're going for the high efficiency stuff, but uh, like the house I lived in when I was down in Slide L was single pane glass. Um, great, inexpensive, right? Easily broken though, and they don't do hardly anything for keeping heat outside the house. Um, when you break these, they create long, sharp jag, uh, long, sharp shards that can be safety issues. Oh, let me go back. Um, we have double pane glass. This improves insulation, so that little air gap in there helps keep some of the heat that's outside the building from getting in or vice versa if it's winter. These are two panes of glass with an air pocket in between. Um, forcing entry may require the two panes to be broken separately, especially if it's like some of the glass that they're putting onto um, government buildings now, which is bomb proof. You actually can't break them. You need to get a K-12 to cut through them. Plate glass. These are stronger and thicker glass for large window openings found in older large buildings and easily broken with a sharp object. So you take a pike pole to it, you got it. Laminated glass is also called safety glass. Um, that's your windshield like we talked about earlier and then tempered glass. This is especially heat treated four times stronger than regular glass and probably like 20 times heavier. Um, common in locations where a person might accidentally walk into the glass and break it. Uh, glass tables are made out of it. Uh, let's see, glass, sometimes uh, sliding glass doors can be made out of it. These break into small pellets without sharp edges and wired glass is tempered glass that has been reinforced with a wire. All right, cool. So some different window frame designs, double hung windows. These are two movable sashes that move up and down Depending on the window, the top one may be the only one that moves. Sometimes it is both. It just depends. You have single hung windows. They're like double hung, but only the lower sash moves, like I was saying. Jalousie. Um, that's what you see in the picture there. I don't really see a lot of these. These are made of adjustable sections of tempered glass encased in a metal frame that overlap each other when they close. So they operate kind of like a set of blinds. Um, I've, I see these in Florida. Uh, there's a couple of buildings. There's a house in Poplarville that has them, unless they've taken them out. I'm not sure. It's down Jacobs Road. But other than that, I really haven't seen these that many places. These are operated by a small hand crank, hand wheel and a crank. And you have your awning windows. And they're just like the Jalousie windows, but there's just fewer panes. They're bigger panes. Horizontal sliding windows, they're similar to sliding doors, but they're just a window, they're not a full door. And people will do the same thing. They'll place that piece of wood there to stop it from being slid open from the outside if somebody were to overcome the lock. Casement windows, um, same thing. I don't see these that often. That doesn't mean they don't exist. I know there's at least one building in Poplarville that's got it because I used to live in it. Um, these are steel or wood frame. They open away from the building with a crank mechanism. So instead of like how the Jalousie windows open up and out, these just open out like doors. And then projected windows, which are factory windows, they're usually found in older warehouses or commercial buildings that project inward or outward on an upper hinge, depends. And then although the screens are rarely used, forcing entry may not be easy. A lot of these are really high up for one thing. They may have fixed wire glass panes above them. Um, so even if you were to break through, you got to deal with that. Sometimes getting a saw up there would be the best way to do it. Or um, don't bother with the glass. Just go straight for the window frame. Fire doors and fire windows are designed to prevent the passage of flames, heat, and smoke. 
It must meet standards set by NFPA 80, which is a standard for fire doors and other opening other opening protectives. So you um, you really don't. I'm not gonna. I don't want to tell you that you don't need to know those NFPA codes by the number, but um, at least know that these NF, NFPAs exist. So when we start doing, when you start looking into codes, trying to figure out if something is up to up to where it needs to be, if you don't know the number, that's okay. Um, but you need to know that, that it exists because whenever you look at a, a NFPA code, it gives you the number. It also gives you the title. So you can search by keyword if you want to, if you're going to use digital codes. All right. Um, windows and doors have to meet different levels of fire resistance, depending on what the building is used for and what the overall type of construction is. Fire ratings cover the actual door or the window, latching hardware, and any other equipment that requires it to operate because if you have, you know, it's only as good as its weakest link. These are equipped with mechanisms that keep the door closed when fire occurs. Um, these are rated for particular duration of fire resistance to standard test fire. So whenever they, whenever the NIH goes and looks into this they'll, and they test it, they'll be labeled and assigned the letters A, B, C, D, or E based on their approved use locations. And you can see here, swinging type door, fire rated three hours. So this door can withstand three hours of um, heat and it's rated with a number it has an E because that's your letter designation, and then um, the number from there. Fire windows. Fire windows are used when a window is needed in a required fire resistance wall. So just because you have to have that resistance there doesn't mean you can't have a window. They do make some that are meant for it and that it can meet the same code requirements. They're often made of wired glass. Um, that's why you usually see those in steel doors. Wired glass provides vision panels in or next to the fire doors. And when only light passage is needed, glass blocks are sometimes used instead. So like the doctor's office or whatever, it's, it's just more aesthetically pleasing than what looks like a jail or like a horror movie um, insane asylum or some of that stuff. All right. Interior finish refers to the exposed interior surfaces of buildings. So your gypsum board, um, if you have wood panel walls, if you got those those 70s style wood panel or whatever, that's your interior finish. Considerations with this include whether the material will ignite easily, how quickly a flame will spread across the material surface, how much energy the material releases when it burns, and how much smoke the material will produce and what the smoke will contain. Um, firefighters must evaluate the combination of interior finish materials in a room. Interior finish is a contributing factor in many large life loss fires. If material does not have the proper flame spread rating, it should be removed, covered, or treated. So if you walk into a room that's supposed to be, um, you know, you're like the life safety code for that particular building occupancy use and everything says that these things need to be met and you come in there and they've got church curtains hanging and stuff stacked to the ceiling and all these things that are really going to, you know, it doesn't matter what the room's made of, the contents are going to burn so fast and so bad that it, it renders the, all the safety mechanisms of the room completely useless. These are the things you want to watch out for. So don't, don't discount what's hanging on the walls. You got to consider everything inside the room. Foam plastics or carpeting should be a red flag to fire inspectors, just to kind of cap that off. Any questions on chapter two? No, sir. Sweet. All right, so um, take about a five minute break while I pull up the slides for chapter three. Uh, chapter three shouldn't take as long, but when we finish that up, we'll be done for the night. We'll get started at 7.35 for this part.
all right, we'll go ahead and get started with this one. Chapter three is not going to be too bad. Um, it's not as much material, but it may be new to a lot of you. So, I mean, it's, it is what it is. Let me get through the knowledge objectives. So we don't really need those. All right. In model building codes, occupancy refers to the intended use of the building. So you're going to hear words like assembly, um, confinement, um, health care, you know, those kind of things. Occupancy classification is designed, is determined by the current use of the building, not the old use. So if they, if it was an old hospital and they renewed, they renovated or they, or started using it for a different purpose, it has to pick up that new occupancy code and it has to follow those rules. A building constructed and used for one purpose may be later used for a different purpose. I mean, things get repurposed all the time, right? Old churches get repurposed. Um, grocery stores become churches, gym or, or gyms or whatever. And before conducting a fire inspection, you, you determine appropriate occupancy class based on current use. Codes and regulations give the requirements necessary to conduct the fire inspection, which is fantastic. That means you don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. It's already out there for you. Depending on your jurisdiction, you may enforce NFPA 101, which is life safety code. You may use the IBC, if you've ever heard that, which is International Building Code. And now, you know, we have people from different departments, and actually we have people from different states in this class. Um, I know Slide L, because I was talking with Jason Bannister. I don't know if you're in class tonight, buddy, or not. but um, you said you all used a, kind of a little bit of both. You mostly used the 101 from NFPA, but you also used IBC as well. What do you guys use? Do you know um, what y'all use in the beta? Chief? I really don't know what he was using. I'm pretty sure he was using mostly uh, NFPA. Okay. Um, okay. I haven't really been able to really nail down. I hate to say it, but that whole situation was just a basic. Uh, it was it's a it was, it was a it's a mess. I got you. Uh, that's why I really haven't pushed too much on trying to get it together right now. Um, until we get this class done. Once I get this class done, our main push is going to be getting all that straight and getting making sure everything's up to par. Well, the cool thing is that you. Uh -huh. can You'll have a lot of say in, in what you guys use. Um, all you have to do is just talk to people. And, and for whatever reason, um, when you go to talk to them, they may be able to pull up previous minutes, and, and I don't know how they record them in a beta, but um, they may be able to tell you, like, hey, you know, this is what he used, this is what we had agreed to before, and, and then you as the fire chief can go in and, and change it if you want. Um, or you, you can do, like, Use you know use what's already there. Use something different. Mix it up. It's entirely up to y'all and whatever the city decides on, which is cool part. Well, really, the problem we have with who was doing our inspections is basically there was no job description, and it was just come to work and go do some inspections. But there was actually no structure as to what was expected of him and the inspection. I got you. So, that, I mean, all the inspection stuff new to me, too. I had to do a lot of research to find out what his actual job description was. And that's why I rewrote um, all of our stuff to do with our Fire Prevention Bureau. Um, just that, that way, from now on, whoever's doing our inspections or doing them the way they should be done in the way that the state and everybody else wants to see them done. We're not just going to go out there and, and do what we think needs to be done. It's all going to be structured as to what should be done and how it should be done. And uh, that's the new guidelines we're going to go by. So Inspector 3 would probably be really, really good uh, for you personally, Chief, just because that's the, what you're describing having to do. That's exactly what that uh, what that level teaches. Um, at that point, you're you're basically taking the the task of assistant chief of prevention. Um, this class or the next one, obviously you need it for three. Um, but this will this will get you on the same page with whatever the last guy was doing, because this is how to do the inspections and how to be the inspector, not necessarily grow the inspection program. Um, but I'll I'll happily help you with that any way that I can. So it's right, a, I appreciate it. Absolutely. So it's very important to determine the correct occupancy classification. 
Uh, model code requirements differ for each type of occupancy. So apparently, like I said, you know, an assembly and healthcare are going to be two very different things. Uh, improperly classifying a building can result in an inadequate or excessive level of fire and life safety. When it's inadequate, lives are at stake. When it's too much, then it's just it's money that's at stake. And sometimes when when people with the control of the budget find that out, um, it, it's you know people aren't going to die from it, but you're going to find that it's hard to keep your job when they find out that you might have over very like severely overspent um because some of this is major investment nfpa 101 life safety code gives 15 occupancy groupings you have one and two family dwellings let me get to the right slide there we go lodging or rooming houses uh hotels and dormitories apartment buildings residential board and care health care ambulatory health care the difference between the two i'll go ahead and stop there and say it health care versus ambulatory um Think of a hospital that's got rooms for you to stay overnight. That's healthcare. Ambulatory healthcare means you walk in and you walk out same day. There's still like so a dentist's office, a doctor's office, that kind of thing would be your ambulatory healthcare. Daycare, um, educational, business, industrial, mercantile, storage, assembly, and detention and correctional. So we're talking about jails and prisons on that one. We do still have to make sure that the people we can find. Um, aren't left to die because we didn't we didn't build a pro you know we we still have to protect them essentially we're removing them but we're not sentencing them off to just come what may one and two family dwelling units a one and two family dwelling unit is a building that contains no more than two dwelling units with independent cooking and bathroom facilities so single family homes duplexes that's what this falls into anything more than that becomes an apartment living unit Separation also helps determine occupancy classification. Regulations for inspection of these units vary by municipality. Sometimes they don't have any um, regulations at all. It just depends. Inspection focuses on means of escape, interior finishes, and fire protection. So placement and functionality of fire protection devices like your extinguishers, your smoke detectors, um, residential sprinkler systems are becoming more common, which is fantastic. Hazards such as utilities, alternate alternative heating devices, storage. Um, you know, like if they, I, I was actually when I was in the fourth grade, I think third or fourth grade. Um, my aunt Biggin, her house burned with me in it. Um, I just wasn't on the side that was on fire. The fire department did a great job of putting it out. They actually got the fire out before they even finished their sweep to make sure that they had gotten all of us out. <laughs> Um, but it had, it had started because of a gas fire, or I'm sorry, a gas heater, one of those old ones that they put in the wall. One of those caught fire and actually caught the living room on fire. Provide fire safety education when your inspection shows that it is needed. So if you walk in and you know the the batteries are dead or removed from the fire from the smoke detectors, or um, you know you've got all kinds of loose materials built right up like pushed right up against the fireplace and there's obvious signs that they use the fireplace those those are some things that you might want to have a talk with them about um not necessarily waiting for october to do it lodging or rooming houses a lodging or a rooming house is a building or portion thereof that provides sleeping accommodations for a total of 16 or fewer people on a transient or permanent basis. So your Airbnb um, falls into these. They may provide meals, but not separate cooking facilities for individual occupants. No personal care services are provided. Some examples, guest houses, bed and breakfast, small inns or motels, foster homes. Occupants may be unaware of their surroundings and depend on the building's fire and life safety features. And most of the time, these are travelers that don't have a clue um, necessarily anything about where they're at or what the um, the building is set to, you know, what like how the building's built or anything of that, of that nature. If you're going to inspect these, you're looking for building building compartmentation, especially if these are if they're if it's a bed and breakfast, it's got multiple rooms for multiple people. Um, that compartmentation will go a long way because somebody in room one may be accidentally starting fires or purposely starting fires or whatever. Um, person in building in, in room number two, 
hopefully who has no clue of what's going on in there will will have time to get out because who knows how long fire in room one is going to grow before fire in, or a person in room two realizes it. Compliance with use and code requirements, interior finishes, protection of exits, because you're, you're dealing, again, with transient people. Um, these kind of become more like a commercial building than they do a residential. Building services and fire protection systems. Inspections should also address housekeeping, electrical installations, heating appliances, cooking operations, fire alarm and detection systems, and sprinkler systems. All right, hotels. So now we're stepping up to the bigger version of this. A hotel is a building or a group of buildings under the same management that has sleeping accommodations for over 16 people and is primarily used by transients for lodging with or without meals. Some examples, modern fire resistant high rise hotels like Drury, Holiday Inn, so on and so on. Um, may include restaurants, meeting rooms, ballrooms, stages, theaters, retail stores. Some of these are pretty fancy. Uh, the West End down in New Orleans has that Starbucks and then the malls attached to it with the, along with the parking garage. Um, offices, storage rooms, maintenance shops, all that stuff can be part of these. Each may fall under a different occupancy class. Um, when the various occupancies are separated with their own means of egress, they can be treated as separate, separate occupancies, which is great. So you might have a hotel attached to a... Um, like a um, a convention center, which would be an assembly. Uh, they may be they may be actually like the same structure, but depending on how they how they're divided up, if they put a good party wall between them at that point, then you can have that. You can have hotel on one side and assembly on the other. If there is no definitive fire protection there, you may not you you can't technically. The the, the book answer is you can't. However, like Jonathan said on the first night, um, sometimes when when politics gets involved there's a little bit of a gray area but at some point it's still just flat out wrong uh and you have to be able to put your foot down sometimes in a tactful way inspections focus on all interior areas guest rooms top floors front desk areas lobbies assembly rooms service areas and then fire and life safety protection so fire alarms should be clearly heard in all rooms Exit routes must be clearly marked and lighted as well. Like if you're in a hotel room, you ever notice on the inside of your door, a lot of times they have the layout of the room, of the floor you're on so you can find your way out before you even leave the room. An appropriate fire and emergency plan should be in place and personnel should have the necessary training. A dormitory is like a subset of this. Uh, this is a building or space in a building in which group sleeping accommodations are provided for more than 16 people. So it still kind of fits that hotel occupancy, um, but who are not members of the same family. And the thing about dorms is that your your residents tend to stay a little bit longer. So uh, maybe one room or a series of closely associated rooms, joint occupancy and single management with or without meals, without individual cooking facilities, Well, I lost my spot. And then your inspection should focus on, again, means of egress, because we're worried about life safety first. Means of egress, interior finishes, building contents, housekeeping, fire protection systems, and uh, use of alternative heating devices and overloading electrical circuits, especially if it's an old building. New buildings, most um, most hotels now have multiple circuits running into every room. It's fantastic. You don't have to worry about plugging up your iron and then popping the circuit or anything like that in your hotel room. But um, older buildings sometimes weren't really built that way. And most of them should have been updated, but sometimes you may run into one that hasn't. Apartment buildings. An apartment building is a building or portion thereof containing three or more dwelling units with independent cooking and bathroom facilities. So these are meant to be long-term Occupancy may be based on location, design, and age and social status of the occupants. We have in Poplarville, um, I know right off the bat, we've got a senior assisted, well, not assisted, but senior living apartments right there behind the high school. Um, that can change how you view that place when you're walking in. If you go to the apartments on Highway 11, 
versus those apartments on Jacobs Road, you may have a much more um, a much higher level of critique when you go into those senior assisted living ones, because you know that most of the people that are there are not going to be moving very fast, trying to get out of their house or out of their apartment. Um, do y'all have anything like that in Abita? I don't, I don't, I don't think I ever responded to anything of that sort when I was down there. Um, apartments that are meant for senior living. And, uh, the closest thing we got is going to be uh, the Alexander Mill neighborhood. Um, it's a facility where it's um, all female, and it's it, they're they're all uh, they partially disabled. Some of them functioning, some of them non-functioning. And it's uh, like 14 different units, and there's four residents in each unit, which they have a 24-hour care person with them at all times in each unit. Um, so it's not necessarily kind of like a hospital setting. It's more of like a, um, a mini residential setting where, like I said, each unit has four occupants in it, which is four bedrooms, one common kitchen, and two bathrooms. Okay, so it's more like a dormitory. Yeah, kind of like that. It's uh, yeah, I guess you could say dormitory. Okay. Hmm. All right. So, um, when it comes to these, you must be aware of the code requirements in place when the building was constructed, and sometimes they may differ from those of for, for newer buildings. So, especially if they haven't been renovated more than fifty percent, that means they don't have to go through their new. Um, they don't have to if. If they're renovating less than 50 percent they don't have to bring everything up to code so if it's an old building with a new addition that is not over 50 percent um you're gonna have to it's gonna make your life a little harder because you're gonna have to keep up with the old code that things got grandfathered in as well as the new code for the renovations inspections for these focus on the exterior of the building the occupant load Dwelling units, means of egress, interior finishes, protection of openings, waste chutes, which may, you know, they may or may not have those um, hazardous areas, fire and life safety equipment, which would be like your fire alarm and detection systems, portable fire extinguishers, sprinkler and or standpipe systems and lighting. Residential board and care occupancy. A residential board and care occupancy is a building or a portion thereof, again, because like you can you can mix these, uh, used for lodging and boarding of four or more residents. So now we're getting back down in, into the smaller numbers. Not related by blood or marriage to owner or operators uh, and for the purpose of providing personal care services. So group housing for physically or mentally handicapped persons. I know that in Covington, there's a lot of group homes because my mom used to be a nurse for those way back in the, in the 90s. Um, group housing for the elderly with personal care but not nursing care so i think that's more in line with what you were talking about facilities for social rehabilitation alcoholism drug abuse or mental health problems so those of you guys in mississippi um pine grove I've, I've never actually inspected that building but it sounds like it would fit this yeah. assisted living facilities in general the inspector must be able to distinguish between personal care and health care if a nurse care is if nursing care is provided, then the facility is healthcare occupancy. If there is no nursing, and it's just say like CNAs, people to help them with their day to day routine, but not medical care, then that is personal care. Inspections for these focus on the capability to evacuate residents in the event of an emergency. So think about a nursing home. Um, if you were to walk in and inspect this and you've got, I don't know, we'll say 50 rooms. In each of those rooms, you have 50 residents, but you only have one exit, right? And it's at the far end. And oh, by the way, their beds aren't on wheels. And you only have like one worker for every 10 people. Those should be some serious red flags. There should be something that you can... Uh, you'd be like, nah, this this isn't gonna work. You know, y'all have to get beds on wheels or more people or you know, renovate this building to put another exit. You know, that kind of thing. Um, those are the things that you're gonna look for, and and you may not be able to tell them to 
change the, the basic structure of a building, that may be unreasonable. But what you may have to do is tell them that you can't use this structure for this purpose. They may come down to that. Um, and that gets that gets tough because you start telling a business something and it's in a small town. A lot of times you're start, you're going to start fighting money. I mean, you're going to be realistic about it. So make sure your ducks are in a row. Um, talk to your chief of prevention. Talk to your chief in general and get on the same page because it may wind up being an argument. Anyway, for your inspection purpose, um, capability to evacuate the residents, like I said, building compartmentation. So kind of like those hotels, protection of vertical openings, hazardous areas, fire alarm and detection systems, fire suppression equipment an appropriate fire and emergency plan in place. You're going to see that. It's kind of like when you went to EMT school and they said you were going to check your ABCs and give oxygen to everything. You're going to see that a lot in this, which is good because the more we beat it into you, the more you're going to know when you walk into a building, here's the things I'm going to look at. And that way you're not, you're not spending so much time looking down at your checklist. You're actually able to look at the building around you. Healthcare. A healthcare occupancy is used for purposes of medical or other treatment or care of four or more persons on an inpatient basis. So again, you have healthcare and then you have ambulatory healthcare, which we'll get to in a second. Healthcare is people that can actually stay there. Like if they're going in for an inpatient surgery and they're going to be in there for a while or a heart attack patient that goes to a cath lab and he's going to be in there for a while, multiple days. That's what these are. These are your full blown hospitals. Uh, occupants are mostly incapable of self-preservation due to age, physical or mental disability, security measures not under the occupant's control. Occupants include infants, convalescents, infirmed age patient or persons, and some examples are going to be hospitals and other medical institutions, nurseries, nursing homes, and limited care facilities. When you inspect these, check for the means of egress. Fire alarm and detection systems and fire suppression systems. And most hospitals in place today have some really robust fire suppression systems. I mean, you're not really going to walk into um, something out of a horror movie unless you're in a town even smaller than Poplarville. Even even the Poplarville um, hospital, I don't think is, I think it's pretty well built at this point. Safety plan, training and drills. You're your personnel hopefully are doing drills to figure out, you know, how long is it going to take them to get everybody out of the building if they get on, if it catches fire. Not everything has to be pull a fire alarm. Sometimes it can just be, here's a bed, you know, nobody in it, but go put it in that far room at the end of the hallway. And then um, at some point today, I'm going to say the fire alarm went off and you have to go and get that bed out, see how long it takes you to move it. And then multiply that by, however many beds you got on the floor. I mean, it's, it could be tabletop stuff, whatever, but they need to be doing drills. That's something that you want to see when you talk to them. Ambulatory healthcare. Again, this is healthcare where they're not staying overnight. They're going to be in and out. So um, outpatient surgeries, if you're going to get a tooth removed or um, something of that sort, get a scope done. An ambulatory healthcare occupancy is used for, to provide outpatient services or treatment to four or more patients simultaneously, but they're not going to stay there overnight. Services include one or more of the following uh, treatment that renders patients incapable of self preservation under emergency conditions without the help of others, anesthesia that renders patients incapable, and emergency or urgent care for patients who are incapable of self preservation. So, this is a place where you can go and they can knock you out. Um, if you're going to get a, an endoscopy done, um, you know, a GI scope, uh, anything they might actually need an anesthesiologist to knock you out for would be done in this kind of thing. Like I said, the, the main difference being is that you're not going to stay there overnight. These do not provide overnight sleeping accommodations. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Examples include freestanding emergency medical units, hemodialysis centers, um, outpatient surgery units, and oral surgery centers. Inspections focus on your means of egress. Protecting or protection features like building construction, smoke barriers, fire alarm and detection systems, portable fire extinguishers, compartmentation, where if, if a fire starts in one room, it doesn't spread as easily. It, it stays in that room unless something happens to allow it to spread. Determination of any hazardous areas such as labs. Verification of appropriate written fire safety plan training and drills.
daycares. Um, and everybody's got daycares. Abita's got daycares. Poplarville's got daycares. My backyard's got a daycare, it seems like. Daycare occupancy is an occupancy in which four or more clients receive care, maintenance, and supervision by people other than their relatives or legal guardians for fewer than 24 hours a day. Examples include adult daycare occupancies, child daycare occupancies, daycare homes, kindergarten classes conducted within a daycare occupancy, and nursery schools. Uh, these are not subject to requirements for educational occupancy. So if they're even if they're doing like kindergarten classes, they're still not considered a school. The three subclasses of daycare occupancies are distinguished based on the number of clients service. So you have daycare occupancies, group daycare, and family daycare. Your inspection focuses on the occupant load, uh, which is actually gonna you're gonna see that in almost every assembly, every every commercial building that has multiple people in it's gonna have an occupant load. Means of egress components, so the capacity of means of egress, number of exits, how far to get to those exits, arrangement in the means, um, discharge from the exits, where do they go when they get out? Are they going to dump out immediately into a street and get run over, or um, are there any, is there any like a fire? Is there a fire hydrant sitting right outside the door that's going to block people? That kind of thing. Proper illumination of means of egress and emergency lighting, clear marking of means and any special means of egress features. Protection of vertical openings, protection from hazards, interior finishes, fire alarm and detection systems, um, alarm and communication systems, extinguishment requirements, building services and operating features. When you're dealing with kids, you'll notice that there's a lot of stuff you gotta watch because they don't know, it's not like a bunch of adults. Uh, you're talking about kids that may not even know how to go to the bathroom yet. so. They're really not going to know how to get out or they're going to follow people, um, trip over things, that kind of stuff. So they really they really do expect you to critique daycares heavily. Education occupancies are buildings used for educational purposes through the 12th grade by six or more persons occupied at least four hours a day or 12 hours a week. You have in academies, kindergartens, regular schools, you know, high schools, middle schools, that kind of thing. Um, these are not classified as an educational occupancy if beyond the 12th grade. So colleges don't count. Colleges don't count. May also be classified as an assembly occupancy if occupancy threshold reaches 50 or more. That's going to be, I want to go ahead and beat that into the ground now. Um, it's considered an assembly if it's 50 or more. So the gym, right, the high school gym is going to be technically a separate um occupancy type than the classrooms because the gym is designed to hold more than 50 people so that's an assembly when you're inspecting a school and you walk into the gym you're going to have to shift gears and that is that's a magic number all right it's always that 50 is a threshold that goes from something else to assembly and that something else can be anything that we've talked about it is important to develop an understanding of activities conducted within the building the number of occupants and the age of the occupants. For business, a business occupancy is used for the transaction of business other than mercantile. Um, so a Best Buy is not gonna fit into this. Examples include general offices, doctor's offices, government offices, city hall, municipal office buildings, outpatient medical clinics, um, where patients are ambulatory and they're not being put to sleep. So your, your basic, Urgent care would be one of these. College and university classroom buildings with fewer than 50, because if they're over 50, they're going to be assembly. Air traffic control towers and instructional laboratories. Typically, large number of occupants during the business day and limited occupants during non business hours. The buildings that you're going to see on these are your nine to five buildings. When they close up for the day, if there's anybody there, it's usually just a cleaner or a security guard and that kind of thing. There's no customers, there's no, most of the workforce is gone. Inspection focuses on means of egress, protection of openings, hazardous areas, protection from of organizations records, and building services such as waste disposal and the utilization of shafts, chases, and fire protection systems.
Industrial occupancies is an occupancy in which products are manufactured or in which processing, assembling, mixing, packaging, finishing, um, dealing with different um, like heavy duty stuff, like you can see in the picture, right? It doesn't have to be solid sheets of metal. It can be gas or whatever, but um, that's what these are going to be. Examples include factories, furniture manufacturers, laboratories using hazardous chemicals, power plants, refineries, sawmills. Um, closest thing you guys are going to have in the beta, the brewery would fall into this. And I'm trying to think. Um, best equipment in Poplarville would be your closest. I mean, it doesn't always have to be a giant refinery like you see in the picture. Just anything industrial would 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 count. Occupants are exposed to a wide range of processes and materials of varying hazard. Special purpose industrial occupancies are characterized by large installations of equipment dominating the place. Um, there's going to be a lot of noise. There's going to be, and, and that's the thing, you know, when you're looking at egress, I'll go ahead and add this in there. When you're looking at egress, if you're in a place that is deafeningly loud, you pretty much are shutting down one sense. So if a fire alarm goes off, how are you going to know? if all you hear is the deafening roar of the equipment that's around you. So, you know, when you walk into these places as an inspector, think about that. Be like, all right, look, you have um, fire alarms. They're going to go off, but are you, is anybody going to hear it? So you may want to make sure that they have good visual cues as well when you're doing your inspections. Each building or separated portion should be inspected depending on the requirements of its primary use. So some inspection considerations include Occupant load, uh, means of egress, protection of openings, hazardous materials, use in storage, inside storage and outside storage, housekeeping and maintenance. And then when you get down into your fire protection systems, you're going to be looking at things like the fire alarm, detection systems, portable fire extinguishers, water supplies, fire pumps. If they're excessively large places and their fire extinguisher or their, um, sorry, their sprinkler systems go a uh, either a very long distance or if they have stand pipes of some sort that are already charged, they may have fire pumps built in. Stand pipe systems themselves, sprinkler systems, and special extinguishing systems. All right, mercantile occupancies, these are your actual like grocery stores or um, Walmarts, that kind of thing. A mercantile occupancy is used for the display and sale of merchandise. Examples include shopping centers, supermarkets, drugstores, department stores, auction rooms, and restaurants with fewer than 50 persons. Because again, 50 is your magic number. Large numbers of people in a relatively unfamiliar place uh, contain sizable quantities of combustible contents that are arranged in some really jacked up ways. One of the problems we ran into with the, um, the Main Street fire the interior crew went in. I really kind of wish Justin was here to talk about that tonight. The, the the interior crew went in and they went into the building next to the one that was on fire because it was a shared, it was, a, you know, the city block in Poplarville. If you, even if you drive there today, the other blocks are built the same. They're all one giant building per block and they're divided into different stores. Um, the one that caught fire, it caught fire on the Masonic Lodge, which was on the far north side of that block. And so to get into it and, and kind of attack from the unburned side, which is what we always taught at the time, um, they went into the store next to it, which was a like a clothing store. Uh, I think it was a clothes closet. And that store was so packed with racks of clothes that they would sell and stuff like that, that it was almost it was Im almost impossible in the limited visibility and everything. Um, for the crew to even find their way to the to the wall where they were trying to get access to the uh, Masonic Lodge. I mean, they could obviously follow the the exterior wall, but I think even that was was messed up with stuff like they had stuff hanging over it and, and mannequins and things hanging off of the little stage displays and all that stuff. It was it was I wasn't in there, um, but all I heard from anybody that was was it was a nightmare trying to get around, trying to figure out where you were at, and that's. They were the only ones in the building, right? This was like two o'clock in the morning. So imagine if it's a fire during business hours and you've got a whole bunch of people stuck in there and, and your firefighters are going to have to go in and um, try to find them all. It can be a disaster. So that's the kind of stuff that when you're looking at it from an inspector standpoint, you want to try to focus on 
keeping them from from arranging things in such a way that causes that mass confusion. Um, your inspection should focus on the occupant load, means of egress, interior finish, protection of openings, protection from hazards, fire and life safety protection systems, and verify operational status, maintenance, and testing of those. Because sometimes they let that lapse, they let that get away from them. Storage occupancies, these are the easy ones. A storage occupancy is used for the storage of sheltering of goods, merchandise, product, or vehicles. You're really not meant to have people in there. Um, so you'll see that when you're doing your inspection for storage occupancies, they're really lax on this. Relatively low human occupancy, verified or varied hazards associated with materials stored. Examples include warehouses, freight terminals, parking garages, aircraft storage, hangars, truck and marine terminals, cold storage, barns, so on and so on. Maybe separate facilities or part of a multi-use um, occupancy. And they may be found within other types of occupancy. So you may have a um, like a large walk-in closet, for example, in, a, in an office building. Um, that would fall under storage. So again, when you get to that one room, you will change gears to storage and not hold that room to the same standards that you're holding the rest of the building. Inspection focuses on building contents, protection of openings, indoor and outdoor storage practices, hazardous materials and processes, housekeeping, occupant load, means of egress. And we're talking about the ones that, you know, the larger stuff, not the, not the storage closet. Fire protection systems. So your fire alarm and detection system, portable fire extinguishers, fire pumps, uh, fire pumps, and your standpipe system. All right, assemblies. Assembly occupancies are buildings used for the gathering of 50 or more persons and pretty much for any reason. All right, so for this is going to say deliberation, worship, entertainment, eating, drinking, amusement, awaiting transportation, or similar uses. Uh, special amusement buildings, regardless of occupancy load. So if it's a, a carnival, um, let's say it's like a, a mirror, you know, the mirror maze, um, that will be. An occupant, I'm sorry, an assembly is going to follow the assembly because that's the highest life safety uh, code that we follow, even if there's only one person in there. Because that one person may have hell getting out even without an emergency going on around them. Possible panic hazard in case of a fire and emergency. So, you know, think about the station nightclub fire. If you guys haven't seen or looked into that, I highly recommend it. It really drives home why we need to take classes like this and, and focus on prevention. Because any one of the different um, things that we look at in a fire inspection probably would have saved a good 100 lives. Different uses require different considerations. Inspection is going to focus on occupant load, means of egress. Did I hit the wrong button? Oh, there we go. Means of egress, interior finish requirements, um, building services, smoking provisions, whether they allow smoking or not. Fire protection systems, electrical and heating systems, special safeguards that are in place like automatic sprinklers, exhaust systems, even just gypsum board covering the um, the insulation. Small assembly uses uses include a room or space contained within another type of occupancy, using um, used for assembly purposes. So the whole building doesn't necessarily have to be an assembly. You can have a small assembly used as part of another building. Fewer than 50 people. And incidental to that occupancy, uh, but it is subject to the same provisions that would apply to the occupancy itself. So this is like a little subset. <laughs> detention and correctional occupancies. A detention and correctional occupancy. God, I can't talk. I'm getting hungry. A detention or correctional occupancy is used to house one or more persons under varied degrees of restraint or security. So again, you know, we're talking about well, the first thing that comes to mind as we think about is jails, but it's not just that. Um, mental institutions, um, any anything where you might have to actually confine somebody for any reason, not even just if they they broke the law. Um, but some examples, you have jails, detention centers. Correctional institutions and houses of correction, pre-release centers, reformatories, work camps, 
training schools, substance abuse centers, any of those. So Pine Grove could fall into this. Um, five categories correspond to the degree of restraint of occupants. You'll need to know these. Condition one, um, free egress. It means occupants move freely and freely to the exterior. They don't have any locked doors blocking them or anything like that. Condition two is zoned egress. Occupants move freely from sleeping areas to smoking compartments. All right, so they have they don't have free access to the exit, but they're not confined to just a little bitty box either. Condition three, zone impeded egress. Occupants move freely within any smoke compartment. All right, so their their world is getting smaller with each of these. Condition four is impeded egress. Occupants are locked in a room but can be remotely unlocked. Uh, and then condition five is contained. Occupants are locked in a room with manual lock. So somebody has to come and actually unlock the lock to let them out. And that's the worst kind that you, if you're going to go do an uh, inspection, that's the worst one you're going to walk into because it's so strict on fire code and everything. Because if, if the building catches on fire and the key holder um, is either succumbs to the fire or, um, you know, bails out and runs or whatever um who's going to let the people out of their room out of their out of their confinements so occupants are locked in a room well all right a defend in place strategy should be implemented um if you're going to have you know condition five there's a reason that they're in that kind of a, of a room so if you walk in there try to help them develop a plan that allows you to fight the fire and, and fix the emergency without moving people out of the room um, you can have them try to engineer the room in a way that when it seals off it is completely sealed the, you know if a fire goes around them it goes around them doesn't get into the room um, that kind of thing mm -hmm. occupants are moved to protected areas of refuge within the building that's an option but they're not actually being let out inspection focuses on the construction type capacity means of egress horizontal exits sliding doors Remote controlled release mechanisms, make sure they work, um, and then exit discharge. Interior finish, because that is going to uh, change how fast the fire spreads. Protection of openings, contents, hazardous areas, your sprinkler and standpipe systems, building subdivision, how is it laid out, building services, and emergency plans. All right, multiple occupancies. So a multiple occupancy is a building or structure in which two or more classes of occupancy exist. Um, not to be confused with a building that's got a, fire, a party wall in it, but say like if you have a, a good example of this, because this is one of the floor plans I had to do when I was taking this certification myself. If you've got a massive, um, an LA Fitness, anybody ever been to an LA Fitness? Or ever seen one? almost all of them you have the gym and then they have either like a swimming pool or a basketball court gymnasium and all this stuff is like built into them so cool you know it's an assembly um in one section with an assembly in another section and then you've got some storage units uh, this room over here may not allow 50 people in it so it's it, you know it can change up uh, multi-use buildings basically so a multiple occupancy is a building or structure in which two or more classes of occupancy exist. They're required to comply with the general requirements for multiple occupancies, requirements for mixed or separate occupancies, and classifying a building simply as multiple occupancy is an incomplete classification. You can't just say multiple. You actually have to list which ones it is. Um, so it needs to include mention of occupancy types. If it's going to be part storage, part assembly, or part assembly, part um hotel uh which is actually pretty common you know those those kind of things mixed occupancy contains occupancies that are intermingled so each portion of the building is classified according to its use the following should comply with the most restrictive fire and life safety requirements of the men of the occupancies involved means of egress facilities types of construction and protection and other safeguards a separated occupancy contains occupancies that are separated by fire resistance rate rated assembly. So um, the party wall would be a separated occupancy. It's where you have one structure, one building, 
but you can actually count it as two separate ones because of that firewall or that party wall that's there. If we don't finish by 930, actually we are almost done. Okay, I was about to say, we're hitting the summary here in a second and then that'll be it. Special structures and high rise buildings. Um, I know you guys don't have any high rises in your areas, but who knows where your careers are gonna take you. High rise buildings usually have occupied stories 75 feet or more above the lowest level of fire department access to the building. All right, we can't just put a ladder all the way to the top of a high rise. Special structures include open structures, piers, towers, windowless buildings, underground structures, vehicles, vessels, water surrounded structures, um, membrane structures, tents, those kind of things. Those are your special structures. Occupancy of special structures typically falls under an occupancy classification previously covered. In other words, they're not going to really be their own. They may be an assembly. They may have um, daycares within them. The Twin Towers had daycares in them. Um, schools, all this stuff was there. There was all kinds of stuff in the towers. Um, one of the one of the many reasons why that was so tragic. But um, Plus requirements unique to each special type of structure and then first determine the general occupancy classification and then determine the special ones after that. Um, so figure out what the bulk of the building is used for and then if there's any special additions to it beyond that, um, label those out as well. And that is it for chapter three. Do we have any questions? I know this stuff starts to get, this, this one was mostly inspector stuff there really wasn't a lot of refresher to it unless you've been through something similar already this is recorded so you guys can go back and watch it um but definitely read the chapter these two chapters are the basis for your your inspections so basically what you said is uh you may have a business that's going to have to be inspected from multiple different angles because of the different buildings. Absolutely. Yeah. Your inspection is not going to follow the business. It's going to follow the building and the use of the building. So the usage of that building. Right. So if you've got a business that has three different buildings to it, one of them is an assembly. The other one is offices and another one is storage of hazmat or, or whatever. Each one of those is going to be inspected based on its use. Okay. So like in our situation, we have one building that has multiple different businesses in there with different purposes all together. So we have to inspect each business like that portion of the building as it's by itself. Kind of. Uh, it depends on like, all right. So if they have different purposes, if those purposes are under the same category, because you're still talking categorically here. Um, for example, if one's just offices, you know, you've got it. Well, there. Right, well yeah. one's a church, okay. one's a, a, a boat repair place. Okay. Uh, and I think the other one's a photography studio. Okay. So, yeah, the photography studio would probably just be, it would be plumped in with the office. The church would be an assembly and the um, the boat repair place, depending on what's in it. Um, will be classified separately, and then and and this is just bi um, business types. This is broad. We are going to get more into things that you want to look at when you go in there. Like what's their, depending on what's in there, you know, what's their um, ventilation like? Because let's say it's a um, if they're going to do painting, like a body shop, then there's all kinds of things that go into play as far as like how's their HVAC system, how's their ventilation system, how what about drip pans that they spill. Um, because we're not just inspecting for fire, we're inspecting for hazmat, we're inspecting for medical, all that stuff is going to play into it. But yeah, in, in, the, in the case of what you're talking about, each one of those areas is going to be its own, it's going to have its own list of rules based on its use. And then you're going to go into more specifics from that. That's a good one. Um, I'm going to be in town next week. I'd like to see what place you're talking about when I come in. All righty.
because I'm curious. Next week I work Wednesday. Okay, I think I'm, I think I'm doing Wednesday. I have I have a couple classes that I'm taking, but they're at the they're end capping the week, so it'll be around the, the beginning and the end. Cool. All right. Anything else? What's our class? What's what's the what's the class code for tonight? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I probably should have done that. All right. Um, give me just a second to put one together, and then I'll I'll give it to you. Let's see, we'll do. All right. Do um. A is in Alpha, S is in Sierra, 2, 3, P is in Papa, A, S, 2, 3, P. All right, got it. A, S, 2, 3, P. That's it. Here, I'll even type it in so y'all can see it. There you go. That'll be your code for the night. I didn't see that anywhere. It's in the chat. 